My name is Alana Weiss, and today it is my pleasure to welcome Robert Stephen Kaplan to the Leading at Google series. Rob is the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice at the Harvard Business School. And prior to joining HBS, Rob served as Vice Chairman of the Goldman Sachs Group. In 2011, he joined us to speak about his last book, What to Ask the Person in the Mirror. And today, he will speak to us about his recently published book, What You're Really Meant to Do, A Roadmap for Reaching Your Unique Potential. Please join me in welcoming Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alana. You can hear me all right? I guess you can hear me all right. OK. so. Uh, Thanks for having me here. Here's what I'm going to uh, talk about. What are you really meant to do? This is a fancified title. Uh, but basically, the point of this is how do you reach your potential? Uh, great companies, in my experience, work with their people to reach their potential. Okay. And I think this company is a great example. Google is a great example. And, it, and, and I'm going to talk about today what it means to reach your potential. Um, and basically, every company and everybody here is trying to do, and this is what my last book was about. I scribbled a few things up here. Every company articulates a clear vision about how you add value and what you need to be great at. So how do you add value to customers? people using your service, and what you need to be great at. And then the rest of your life is spent trying to update that vision, set priorities, and the rest of your time is executing, trying to align so you achieve that vision. That's what great companies do. But they do one other thing. Within that, they try to help people that work there be the best that they can be. And that means in a company of many thousands of people, each person is unique, and the best that you can be is going to be something different depending on who you are. And to build a great company, you need as many people as humanly possible being the best that they can be and not trying to be like everybody else. And that's been my experience in business, uh, and I think that's been key to building a great company. It's also the key, in my opinion, to you reaching your dreams. So what do I mean by reaching your potential? Reaching your potential to me means creating your own definition of success. What is success to you? Now, that, you say, oh, of course, it means creating my own definition of success. My experience is most people don't. And most very smart people often don't. And why? because we grew up in an education system and in a society that is constantly defining success for us. When you go to school, if you're majoring in something, you have a bunch of tests and things you're trying to do to excel. And you're worrying about metrics, grades. Once you get in a job, uh, same thing. You're worried about metrics, the next promotion, trying to achieve whatever the metrics are of the business. And society, in every magazine, newspaper, television program, society is constantly defining what success is. Usually, based on money, it may be based on other power, maybe another one. And then you've got your friends and your family and your loved ones who are constantly trying to beat in your head what they'd love to see you do. Now, there are exceptions to this. But conventional wisdom and peer pressure and other people dividing our success is so pervasive that most of us are not even aware that it's influencing us. It's so pervasive. We're not even aware we're doing it. And the reason I, I see this is I have people come visit me from age 20 to 30 to 50 to 70 to 85 who are struggling with this problem. Uh, it may be that there's somebody who's thinking about their first job and trying to figure out what they really want to do. It may be somebody who's 20 years into their career and wonders how they got into this situation that they're in and trying to figure out how to get out. <laughs> it better yet, I get people who are 70 years old come to me who's ha had great career, been CEOs, achieved the dream, everything society could say, is, and they don't feel that way. And now they're trying to figure out what they're going to do now. So what I've learned from this is the key is not necessarily 
to reach somebody else's definition of success. It's to reach your unique potential. And let me explain what that means. What that means to me is, how do you add value? What competencies do you build that are meaningful to you? And here's the reason it's so damn hard to reach your potential. You never get there, okay? In any given job, when you're in college, you probably reached your potential to get a job here. That's fine, but college is over. Now you gotta go to work. Okay, so now you're a junior person or a mid-level person at Google. You may be reaching your potential now, but it's still not over. The company is changing, you're changing, you might get promoted. You've gotta try again to reach your potential. You may get bored. There may be other changes in the world and needs in the world that you believe you want to attack. And what I've learned is you always think, oh, if only I could get to here then, okay? And it never works that way. Because once you get to here, you say, uh, now what? <laughs> now what? But you know, maybe it's my personal life. I married and had children. And then my children, then, that's what's missing. And you get that and you realize, well, that's good, but now what? It's always a question of now what. So what I'm going to describe today is a little bit of a process. And I liken it, the best way I would liken reaching your potential is the same as losing weight or getting in shape. Because if I told you, lose 20 pounds and you're done, you never have to worry about what you eat again. You'd say, oh, that's stupid. Okay, or if I said, get in shape and then you don't have to exercise anymore, you'd say, no, that's stupid. And reaching your potential is the same. And you should think of it the same, but we don't. We tend to think of it as a magic answer or a destination. And what it is is a series of steps. It's about process. In the same way, losing weight or gain, getting in shape or becoming a great something is about process. And most of us don't think about it this way. And what I'm trying to get people to do is realize this is a process. You need to follow this process. I do not have an answer. I don't have an easy destination. No, you are not going to get there. It's going to have to keep evolving. You'll reach your potential at various stages. Then you'll change your mind and you'll go for something else. But if you learn the process, I think you're going to be very satisfied with where you get. I don't know that, uh, whether, what that means about how much money you're going to make or how much style you're going to have or how much status, but I think that's you're going to learn in the long run. Those are outcomes that tend to follow performing at a high level and reaching your potential. All right? So my question is, if you believe you really want to reach your potential, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to follow a process? And this is simple enough, but it's hard as can be, okay? And the reason I've learned about this, I've been working on this for 30 years, because I've built companies, I, I, I run a venture philanthropy firm, we build nonprofits, Draper Richards Kaplan, and everything I'm trying to do every day is get people to reach their potential. Why? Purely selfish on my part. And that if I can get people in our organizations to reach their potential, then I got a better chance to reach mine, okay? And, and that's what builds great organizations a group of people, thousands ideally, that are working to achieve the vision of the company, but working to be at their best. And companies normally will help you, but I would argue you've got to own this. You've got to own it. If you're waiting for somebody else to tap you on the shoulder and tell you how to reach your potential, stop. You can stop now. You own it. You're gonna own it the rest of your life, and I want you to own it and t get in the habit of owning it. So how do you do that? Number one. First, and I'm just going to talk through uh, for 20, 30 minutes what some of the steps are. And they seem brutally simple, because they are, but they're really hard. Step one, you have to actually be able to write down on a piece of paper, and I'm, I'm going to probably encourage you to try this. The book has lots of exercises on how to do this. Can you write down your strengths and your weaknesses? Now, most people say, oh, yeah, I can do that. And normally, the reason I know this, I meet with ridiculous number of people every year one-on-one, -on -one. CEOs all the way down to college students, and it's unusual for me to meet somebody who can accurately write down their weaknesses. I say to them, tell me what your strengths and weaknesses are. When we get to the weaknesses, well, you know, I'm very impatient, uh, doesn't suffer fools gladly, uh, knock it off. Tell me the truth, what are your weaknesses? I know you got them. 
What are they? Uh, well, tell me what you heard in your last review. Well, they said just keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Uh, did you get paid at the top of your peer group? Well, I don't think so. Well, how'd they explain that? Uh, they didn't. Okay. So, so the point of this is you get in your year-end review and you're like, and I'm the same way, I'm like thinking, oh my God, I hope this goes well. And uh, oh my God, I don't hear, hope I hear anything's going to make me feel terrible. And you get the heck out of there and it's over. And what I'm saying to you is you've got to own being able to find out what your strengths and weaknesses are. And it's not so easy. But if you, my experience is extremely high percentage of the time. If you know what your weaknesses are, you're almost always going to improve. My experience is why don't people improve? Why have I had people in their careers where I think, God, this person's got all the skills. What the, what's the problem? They're not willing to recognize I have this weakness. A second you do, you'll either decide it's not realistic to improve on it. Let's say you've got to be, you know, you, you're, you're quantitatively weak. Could be you, you're, you're just quantitatively weak. Uh, fine, pick something else. But can you write down your weaknesses and learn how to deal with it? I don't say, I'm not saying you have to improve on every weakness, but you have to have a strategy for how to deal with it. Okay, so that's point one. Can you write it down? Now, here's why this is complicated. It has to be relative, it has to be skill-based. Okay? Not popular is not a strength or weakness. It's got to be skill. Analytical skills, uh, uh, written skills, speaking skills, uh, domain expertise. I've got in the book 25 different skills that you could list and put your, next to each one a plus, a minus, or a neutral. It's got to be skill-based, number one. Number two, it has to be relative to a job, to a task. Here, let me give you an example. I am a very fast runner. I've always been a fast runner. That's fantastic. That's a strength. Except, if the job is to be an Olympic sprinter, it's not a strength anymore. Again, versus a peer group that's superb at that job, it's now a weakness. In fact, I couldn't even bother to try out. They wouldn't even let me try out. I'm so slow. And same with a job. You need to look at the job you're in or the one you aspire to, especially the one you aspire to, and can you write down the two or three skill weaknesses that you have relative to that job? Okay, try that. Now second, the, here's the other reason this is so darn hard. In my experience, you can't do this alone. You can't, you'd love to think, okay, I can do, I, can, I could do this by myself. My experience is no, and here's why. All of you and all of us, me included, have blind spots, okay? In that you don't see yourself clearly. So you may have a weakness that you're not even aware of. But I can tell you for darn sure, if I asked that question to all five or 10 people that work with you every day, and I said, tell me the strengths and weaknesses of so-and-so relative to the job they're in, they could give them to me fast. They know your weaknesses, they don't even have to think about it. The only person that may not know is you, okay? Now how's that possible? Why wouldn't they just tell you? Because they don't want to upset you or offend you they want to be on good terms with you, or you may send off a vibe that you don't want to know. Okay, so my experience is you've got to seek coaching from people who observe you as to what they observe your weaknesses are and your strengths. But the problem is they're not going to tell you unless you ask. You have to give them permission, and you have to be convincing that you really want to hear it. Because the most difficult weaknesses you have, they may not want to tell you. Here's a good one I used to struggle with in coaching people. You say different things to different people. Under pressure, you kind of shade the way you explain what happened. That's a weakness. How do I tell you that without offending you? Okay, you're going to have to come to me and say, I really want to improve, and will you give me any advice from what you've observed in my behavior? And you're going to have to convince me you really mean it, because when I give you that one, you're going to think, what a jerk. <laughs> right? That guy is a jerk. Right? And then the, the, me giving it, I'll think, ugh, why did I stick my neck out? 
okay? But the stuff you need to hear is the kind of stuff that people are not necessarily going to want to tell you. The easy stuff you know. The deeper stuff, people may be fearful of offending you. you got to ask. And in this regard, I wrote down one other thing. There's a difference between coaching and mentoring. A lot of you may think you have a mentor, okay? We use coaching and mentoring like they're the same thing. They are absolutely not. Mentoring is, I tell you a story, you give me advice back based on my story. Problem is, your advice is only as good as my story. And my story paints me as like a savior. You know, I did this, and I did this, and then I got screwed over this way, or I, got, I had this bad happen to me, and you say, oh my God, those people you work with, they sound terrible. Oh my God, they're probably very jealous of you, uh, because uh, uh, you went to Harvard Business School. Well, I said, no, they went to Harvard Business School too. Well, okay, then they're just jealous of you. Or maybe you're, they think, well, yeah, no. So mentors often give advice that get people blown up. Okay, but a lot of people, if I, you've given enough, as many year-end reviews as I have, I've had people say back to me, my mentor tells me I'm doing a great job and there's something wrong with the review system. Okay, that's mentoring. It's got its limits. It can be useful for certain tactical advice, but it's not the same as coaching. Coaching is different. It requires direct observation. Any of you play tennis or a sport? Golf, how often do you call a coach up, a tennis coach, and say, let me describe my swing to you over the telephone. I put a leg out, and then I, and they say, well, that sounds pretty good. Then they see you swing, and it's terrible. Okay, that's the difference between mentoring and coaching. In order to write down your weaknesses, you need coaching, meaning someone who actually sees you in action because you may not even realize your weakness well enough to even describe what you're doing. Okay? But this is the key. You know, in a company, and I used to run companies, you can change everything. Given enough time, uh, determination, and money, I can change a lot of things in the company. Sadly, with human beings, you'd like to think you can change everything about yourself. I'm afraid not. There are limits. I am only 5'11", and as much as I would like to dunk a basketball, and I always want, I'm never going to do it. Okay, and I can't change things to change that. I can't even palm a basketball, but I still try. But, but the point is, with you, everything you do's got to start, reaching your potential starts with an honest, accurate assessment of your strengths and weaknesses relative to a job. You need to learn to get in the habit of, rank, of, of, of writing notes down, and I would say for the rest of your life, relative to a job, and seeking the feedback of those that observe you so you can do it accurately. Because my experience is, if you know your strengths and weaknesses, you can either decide to improve on some of the weaknesses, you could decide it's not realistic to improve on some of the weaknesses, and you can surround yourself with people who compliment you, or you can pick a different job. But you have lots of options. The reason people make lousy choices and don't reach their potential often is they are unaware. And why do smart people fail? Two reasons normally. Isolation and inability to learn. That's why outstanding people fail, and I see it every day. Isolation, this is why CEOs fail too, by the way. You get isolated, which means you don't know. You don't know your strengths and weaknesses. You're isolated because you don't seek feedback, and you don't want to know. Inability to learn. I can tell you all, whatever you guys end up, if you are willing to get advice from others who observe you, and you're willing to learn, I don't know where you're gonna go, but you got a heck of a good chance. But it starts with strengths and weaknesses. This is painful for many people. And by the way, just like getting in shape, doing what I'm talking about, if you actually do this, it's gonna be, you're gonna be sore. You're gonna use muscles you're not used to using, but you're going to get better. Second, you do have to understand what your passions are. Now many of you think you pick Google, you're done. I already, I already decided my passion. I worked, decided to work at Google. What more do you want from me? Okay, here's the problem. There's lots of different jobs in this company in the same way there were lots of just different jobs where I was. Uh, you may or may not be in the right area, but I do know this. Passion is the rocket fuel. 
that allows you to work on your weaknesses, makes you get advice from people because it's painful to do, and helps you do all sorts of other things, bad days, bad months, bad years, tolerating adversity. Passion is the rocket fuel that lets you do it, but you do need to know what skill, what, what tasks you're passionate about, okay? And I think many of you who are here probably do know that, but you gotta be able to write that down. It is hard to perform at a very high level for a long period of time unless you're passionate about what you're doing. And here's the problem. Most of us, including me, I loved what I did for almost my entire career. I love what I do now, but there was a time eventually in my career I stopped loving what I did. And I think I never dreamed that could possibly happen. It will happen to you. Either you've been in the two jo same job for too long and you get bored. Or maybe the industry changes, or maybe you change, or maybe something else changes and you run out of gas. This is a, you don't stop thinking about what you're passionate about, including in the community outside work. That's step two. Step three is understanding yourself, okay? Step three is understanding your life story. And when I said, why do leaders fail? Isolation inability to learn. And the biggest uh, issue many people have is they don't understand themselves. Um, and in particular, so you got your strengths and weaknesses, you understand your passions, fine, simple enough. Do you understand your own story? And, and, and for many of you in this audience, as you get more senior, you'll start to see what I mean when you have to start delegating more, when you have to get up more and speak in front of a group when you have to fire people, when you have to hire people, when you have a highly valued person working with you who you have to give bad news to, or you have to give them criticism and you realize I can't do it, I can't confront them. Um, and so for most people, I do a little exercise. When many people come to me for advice, one of the things I talk to them about is their story, because I ask them a series of questions. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you do this? And the truth is, sometimes you don't know why you did what you did. Some of you just don't. Why did you lose your temper? Why did you get impatient? It has to do with your story. And I would comment, you've got three stories. I'm only interested in one of them. There's the facts of your life story. Where were you born? Where did you go to school? Your parents, family, just the facts. There's a second story, which you're, you got a lot of practice at most of you here and most people I deal with, it's called your success story, which is a story of how you overcame obstacles and excelled and got to where you went, where you are now. It normally has uh, uh, drawbacks, it has failures, it has terrible things that happened to you and you said, I will not stand for that, I will overcome that, and I decided right then I was going to do this, and then I went and I did it. And it, it's a, I mean, you're going to cry. It's such an <laughs> inspiring story. And you walk right in here to Google with that resume, and you told that story, and they said, you belong here. And you said, I guess I do. <laughs> okay, here's the little problem. There's a third story. This is not one that you're telling in your job interview. And this I would call is your failure narrative. And every one of you has got one. And I know this because I've dealt with people at all levels and I've got one, several. And this is a story that is based on the same facts of your life. It's about, by the way, most of you, how many of you have been fired? So this is interesting, very few of you. But if I talk to a normal group of people out there, especially entrepreneurs, you'd be shocked how many of them have been fired or believe they've been mistreated or had an injustice done to them. Now, if many of you say, if many of you feel like you haven't had an injustice done to you, just wait, you will. All of us do. <laughs> By the way, injustice happens. The key is, though, for most people, it feeds into your childhood, maybe events growing up, injustice that happens to you, maybe a difficult boss, feeds into your self-doubt. And all of you have a narrative that's in your head, whether you're aware of it or not, right now, that says, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, 
I doubt well, I'll ever, that I'll ever be a blank at Google. I don't think I can. And if you don't think you've got it, let me give you an assignment. Write down your failure narrative. The, the, I go through it at length in the book. And the reason I urge people to write this down, this is the one that isn't politically correct to talk about. You're not sharing it. You're not sharing it with your peers. Most of us wear a mask every day. But we have a self-doubt about something. And I might ask it to you this way. What's your biggest fear? What is your biggest area of self-doubt? What is it you can't do? And if you say nothing, bull. You've got something in your head. And for many people, they're not, they're not even aware that it's in their head. But I can tell you it's affecting what you do every day. It's affecting your ability to reach your potential. And as you get more senior, and you get more responsibility, and the stakes get higher, the failure narrative comes to the fore. And so what I'm encouraging people at all levels to do, write it down. It may surprise you. It may be as simple as talking about injustices in your life. You know, coach that was difficult, anything. But why do people fail? Why do people fail to get feedback? Why do they fail to be able to understand their passions? Why don't they go for it when they see something they want to do? Why do they keep quiet when they should speak up and act like owners? Normally, it's doubt. What is that doubt for you? Can you write it down? Are you aware of it? OK? And I'm going to do this quickly. Now, performance and career management is taking as simple as your strengths and weaknesses, your passions, understanding your story, and matching them to a job. And I don't mean any job. I mean your dream job. Now, question, how many here have a, have a dream job? And how many are not sure what their dream job is? And let me give you an assignment from here on. You should be thinking about it. Because my experience is, if you think about your dream, you are much more likely to get to that dream. And I would say to all of you, whether you think you have a dream or not, I, you do. All of you have an aspiration when you daydream, when you fantasize about what you're going to be doing, how you want to impact the world, the value you want to add. You've got a dream. Think about what it is, and can you write it down? Reaching your potential, in my opinion, is about taking your strengths and weaknesses, your passions, understanding who you are, and trying to connect them to a dream. Now, some of you may say, I don't have a dream. My dream is to be employed. I'm just glad to have a job. My dream is that this company does well, and I can just come in here every day and not be bothered. <laughs> By the way, and for some people, including me, I had years I went through where I felt that way. But my experience with human beings is, that will not sustain you. And my experience is I've not met anybody yet who, who is happy with that for an extended period of time or performs at their best level if they don't push themselves more. So my question is, what's your dream? And then the second question is, you've got to understand, and I talked about this when I was here two years ago, what are the two or three most important things you must do well to succeed in the job you're in or the job you want to do? How does Google add value and the area you're in add value? Can you write it down? And your boss certainly needs to be able to write it down. This is how you mobilize people. How do we add value? What things do we need to be great at? What things do you need to be great at to be outstanding? Can you write down those two or three things? The reason a lot of people failed to reach their potential is they're spending their time on all sorts of things every day, but they don't have on their wall the three things they must do at a superb level. There's a lot of things that I, have, I get asked to do every day. There's only three or four in the job I'm in right now that I need to do at a superb level if I'm going to be great. And what you learn to do, this is how you choose priorities. You've got to decide how to spend your time. Do you match your time with those top three? How many of you can write down the top three tasks that you must be great at to be great at your job? How many of you don't know what they are? And I will tell you, go back, interview your boss if you have to, 
and write them down. I assure you, your boss, she or he or she has them in their, in their mind when they're reviewing you at the end of the year. I certainly do. I can tell you that for sure. And they're measuring you every day against those. It would be better if you took ownership of knowing what those are and strive and then relook at, again, your strengths and weaknesses versus those tasks. How do you rate? Where are you strong? Where are you weak? What do you need to work at? Okay? You've got to do this. And I would say, the other thing, you're not, most of you are too young for this, but as you get promoted, they change. Whatever you need to be great at in your job, when you get moved to a new job, different three. If you get promoted, different three. By the way, world changes, competitors take actions, you have a new strategic initiative, might be a different one or two or three. Do you know what they are because this is what you're driving against? And by the way, you may say, well, I don't have time to do this. I'm working a ridiculous number of hours. And I would say, this is the prism through which you drive every action you take and every decision you make. If that's true, if you're driving a Maserati or whatever you drive at 150 miles, I don't drive one of those, but <laughs> I wouldn't know how to drive one of those, But if you, because I can't drive a stick. But if, if you drove 150 miles an hour, it would be nice if you knew where you were going. What's the vision? What are the top two or three tasks you must do well? Can you write them down? You should gear your um, skills development against those. Your dream job, you ought to think about what the tasks were that you would dream about. When were you at your best working at Google? When did you shine? When were you your best in your life? When did you shine? What were you doing? What tasks were you performing? How does it fit with your current job? Maybe there's a job three doors down that's a better one, that's a better fit. But I'm saying you need to take ownership of thinking about this. That's performance and career management. It's not being nice to the boss or pretending that you think what he or she thinks or like, how are you and all that. Nah, forget that stuff. I hate to break it to you. Your, your boss wants to like you, and I know you want to like your boss. But I'll tell you, much more important, they want to think highly of you and how you perform key tasks. They, think, they care about that a whole lot more. Take ownership of that. Okay, let me go very quickly. Uh, good versus great, and, I won't, and I've only got a couple of minutes. My main ab advice is, once you've done strengths, weaknesses, passions, your story, matching all that to the job you're in and what's most important, do you act like an owner? When you walk in every day, do you speak up? When your boss says something dumb, or is about to walk off a cliff, do you say, no, I disagree? Do you stick your neck out appropriately? Do you act like an owner? Do you help others who need help, even though you don't get any credit for it? This is what makes the difference in my experience between people who are decent or good and great. Great companies are made up of people who act like owners. Do you? It, by the way, if you do for others without regard to what's in it for you, I, have strong, I strongly believe you will get multiples more back in return. But if everything you do is, I won't do this unless I get something back, tit for tat, good luck. You're not an owner. Uh, that, I, don't, I, don't, I want to build a company around people who act like owners. You got to act like an owner, do you? Okay, and then the last part is, I said you can't do this alone. You've got to have relationships. And what I mean, I don't mean be connected to 1,000 people on uh, Facebook or have uh, 500 followers or 1,000 followers on Twitter. That's not a relationship. And one of the things I've learned, which has been a shocker to me in the job I'm in, is when I ask somebody, like one of you here, what problems are you having? And people usually come to me when they're desperate. Harvard is like Switzerland. When they've tried everything and then it's sad, they're so desperate they come to me. And uh, I'll ask them, after they give me this earth-shaking revelation and a terrible problem, who have you talked to about it? And the answer more often than not is no one. And I say, no, 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 I must ask that wrong. Who have you spoken with? And they say, no, you heard me right the first time, no one. Well, how could that be? 
And the reason is, and I wrote this down, we're going to talk about this for, uh, at length. Do you have a relationship where you, un people, you understand someone and you trust them and you respect them and they understand, trust, and respect you? Are you willing to disclose things to people? Do you have people you can trust that you're willing to tell things to and seek advice? It helps to do all the steps in reaching your potential if you have relationships. And I will tell you, if you have three or four or five, you're doing well, very well. Most people think, oh, I have 30, or I've got all sorts of friends. That's not what I'm talking about. Who can you talk to when you really need to confide in someone? And for many people, it's no one. This is not something you do over the telephone. You can't do it by email. It means face-to-face -face time with people where you have mutual trust, respect, and understanding. Okay, so we're about out of we're time. We're going to take questions here. So here's my point. I've just described a series of steps. You may be better at certain steps than others, but this is a process. Reaching your potential is not you climb a mountain and you're there. It doesn't work that way. It is a process, and what I'm trying to get people to do is treat it like getting in shape or losing weight or whatever extended regular process. Start using these muscles to reach your potential. It is a long-term, lifelong effort and once you think you've got there, because I've had many times in my life I think, I've got there, and then I realize, uh, no, I actually don't. I still want to do more. I want to be wanted, needed. I want to make an impact on the world. It never ends, and it won't end for the rest of your life, is my experience. I have a 90-year-old mother. She still wants to reach her potential. <laughs> it's human nature, okay? And so let me stop there. Let's go to questions. Uh, just wanted to ask your thoughts on have you done any correlation between reaching your potential and happiness? Are people typically happy when they reach their potential or are they beating up themselves and then trying to reach higher and higher as you move forward? Well, let, let's put it, and this, I, I haven't, I've read studies of people and what, what creates happiness and I've read books and I obviously work in academia. Um, and I've got, and, I, and, I, and a lot of my experience also is anecdotal. Let me put it this way. Uh, I'll, uh, each person is, um, everybody has a little bit different personality makeup. And there's some people as they kid around can never be happy unless they're unhappy, right? And then there's some people that are just much more peaceful, contented, et cetera. My experience though on this score, reaching your potential, I haven't met anybody yet who doesn't want to be wanted and needed and loved and feel that they're vital to someone or some, someone's. Reaching your potential is about figuring out where that is and being able to do it. So does that mean you still won't be aggravated about three or four other things in your life depending on your personality makeup? Yeah, you might still be, but I think the, the people's satisfaction is much higher if they're working to get to a place, not trying to please everybody else, but to try to make sure that they're satisfied with where they are and are adding value to making a positive difference in the world. And most people start off thinking, if I could just make money, I could get to this position, I could get this metric, something, then I think I'm going to be happy because everybody in these magazines I've, or television programs, or uh, seen, everybody it seems to be, and then what they learn is, a, they're not happy because they're not adding the value they want to have. And they're realizing a lot of people that they looked at who they thought were happy aren't as happy as they thought. And so that would be my answer to that. It may not solve be the whole enchilada, but it's a good part of it. When you say if you have three, four, five good relationships, you are doing pretty good. Yeah. Um, is it who are these people going to be? Like, can they be your coworkers, or do you need to select okay. outside of the work? What type of people? Yeah. All right, so here's, let me, let me talk about that. Let me define again a little more slowly what a relationship is. And you should decide, by the way, as I, as I say this, write, make a list on how many people fit this criteria for you, okay? So to your point, a relationship, in my opinion, could be a coworker, it could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be somebody in the community. It might be somebody you don't even like that much or wouldn't want to hang out with, but it's got three things. You understand them 
and they understand you. You trust them, and they trust you. There are a lot of people that I understand and would like to talk to, but no offense, they've got big mouths, and I know if I tell them I don't trust them enough, or they've got some other agenda, and even though they've got a, they're a great, great thinker, I'm not really sure where they're coming from, right? So you've got to trust them, and they, it helps if they trust you, and then respect. You've got to respect them, and they need to respect you. Those, those are the three elements of a relationship. My experience, how do you develop a relationship? Three ways. Each of you has to be willing to disclose something about yourself to the other person. Sometimes in groups, when I have enough time, I do a little 10-minute exercise where I have you pair up with the person next to you, and I say, disclose to them something about yourself that they don't know, that would help them understand you better. And everybody giggles nervously, and then they tell them. And for example, I grew up in Kansas City. My father was a traveling salesman. My mother was a real estate agent. You know, and I, and I go on and explain it. And they say, okay, I understand you a little bit better. Okay, are you willing to disclose something about yourself? Second thing I do is, can you ask the person you just spoke to a question that would help you understand them better? This is the one most of us are lousy at. How often you go on a plane trip with people, you don't really learn anything fundamental about them on that plane trip for business. Or vice versa, they didn't learn anything about you because they didn't ask a question that would allow you to explain yourself so they could learn about you. Okay? For example, I've seen people who've worked together for 20 years, did not know one person, the boss, did not know that subordinate had a special needs child all these years. That was the most important thing to them, never came up. What was that about? So are you willing to ask a question? And then the third one, can you disclose an area of self-doubt and seek advice from that person? I really doubt I'm that great a blank. What do you think? Any advice you would give me? What could I do about this? I do this with people who don't even know each other or some who've been working together for 20 years, just sitting there for 12 minutes, do it fast, and invariably, people who've been working together for 15, 20 years say that's the best conversation I've had in years with this person. 12 minutes. How's that possible? Okay, that's a relation. That's how you build trust, respect, and understanding. You got to be able to tell something about yourself. Okay, not how many drinks you had last night, but something fundamental, real that helps them understand where you're coming from. Maybe what you're worried about. Can you ask them a question that helps you understand them? Can you seek advice from them? And so by that, you may have a few people at work you feel that way about. You may have some people outside work. My problem with many of you is do you have anyone that you can do that with? And I've been surprised, and this is I'll date my, uh, generational. My generation is better at this, uh, to my shock. We're worse at most everything, but at this I'd say we're better than yours. Why? Because we only had two options for communication. Telephone, yes, we did have a telephone. Or you could write a letter, or you, yeah, that was, but that was a pain, and, and, or you could meet in person. You guys have a zillion other modes. Cell phone, terrible. If you really want to understand someone. Email, terrible. I see people, business leaders and people communicating important messages or trying to have a serious conversation by email. Forget it. Misread each other completely. And you see this all the time. People send an email on something that that shouldn't be done by email, shouldn't even have been done by telephone, needed to be done in person. What are they thinking? Okay? So that's what a relationship is. The problem is, if I get back to reaching your potential, strengths and weaknesses, passions, self-doubt, how do you work through that stuff if you don't have any relationships? Because we all have blind spots. Why do leaders fail and outstanding people? Isolation, inability to learn. If you don't have any relationships, if you're connected to a zillion people, but you don't have any relationships, I can tell you without knowing you, you're isolated and good luck on being able to learn. Okay, you're not going to reach your potential. So that's, that's the thought. And I wouldn't have guessed 10 years ago that this was even an issue out there. But I've realized, I've dealt with so many people, it is a big, big issue for people. Big issue. There's a relationship shortage. Much more than a leadership shortage. Um, 
I'm just wondering, what's your advice for people if they always play big portion in their mind to have like failure narratives? Right. Well, so here's, here's the reason I like talking about the failure narrative. First of all, uh, the one thing that you should, if you have the failure narrative always in your head, it might make you feel better to know you're not the only uh, one. I mean, everyone in this room, to varying degrees, now that would shock you, right? Oh my God, no, I'm the only one. Most people think that their failure narrative is unique to them and they're the only one. Not so. I can tell you for, with a certainty, everyone in this room has got one that is in their minds much more than you would believe. Now they cover it over. They look great and their hair is nice and, and everything is great. But I'll tell you, uh, if you watch them enough and could see what they can do and where they just can't do it, that failure narrative is there. So step one is to realize you're not the only one. There's not something wrong with you because you have a failure narrative. Step two is, do you know what it is? And then step three is, how is it affecting your behavior now? And then you get to a question. Do you need to be a prisoner of it? You're not gonna get rid of it, by the way. I have, I have no clue how to get rid of one, but I do believe if you're aware of it and you try to address it, and I'll give you an example it, real fast. You, you address it, you don't need to be a prisoner of it. I was petrified, if you can believe this, of speaking. I could speak in front of 300 people at Goldman Sachs, but when I'd get in front of 1,000 people, I tried it with a written, I, I couldn't do it, I, freak, I, I couldn't do it. Not everybody saw me freaking out, but I freaked out. Okay, fine. If I was gonna be head of investment banking, I was running corporate finance at the time. They called me in, my boss was Hank Paulson, said we're gonna promote you to be head of investment banking. And I, I talked him out of it, I tried furiously, everything I could do to talk him out of it. And then he was co-head at the time with John Corzine, and they didn't get along that well, which has been well documented. So I went around into Corzine and talked him out of promoting me. Okay, Paulson rightly wanted to kill me, okay? But I was so scared, I promised myself I will never become head of investment banking because I never want to get up in front of the annual conference in front of 1,500 people and speak. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get the hell out of here before that happens. No one would have dreamed that because I was such a polished speaker, they thought, in front of groups. And I seemed confident like, in everything. And what I should have done is gone to Hank and say, I am scared. But I didn't think I could. Okay, I was afraid to even disclose it, because I thought, I'm the only one, I'm some weirdo. And then unfortunately, I had to give, without going to the, I had to give a eulogy uh, at a funeral for someone in my family in front of a giant group, and it was, I was petrified, but I learned that if you speak from the heart, I can give that speech, and it got me over it, but I would have gotten over it two years sooner if I had just told somebody and got advice. So my question for you, if you've got that, you're not alone, but can you reach out to somebody? Do you have relationships with one or two people? You can disclose it to them and get their feedback, because I think you can improve on it. You don't need to be a prisoner of it. That makes sense? Thank you very much, everybody. Good to talk to you. <laughs>